how you're phrasing things. For sure. A uh, lot of room for interpretation right now. Matt Wright and I will go, we'll go carve through it. It's your boy. It's my boy. <laughs> um, okay. So we touched on it a little bit, but I think the hot topic, and we're going to put something out tomorrow on it. We're going to include something in the newsletter and then we're going to put a blog out. Uh, but dwell time all of a sudden or deflection because we talked about it last week and you – I basically had never heard of it. You knew what it was. You were kind of explaining it and then very timely. You know, Did you see Annalise tweet mm-hmm. after she played a match? And I don't know who she was playing against. I don't know what the paddle was that that person was using. But you know, she, she won the match. Uh, she <laughs> tends to do. Um, but then she tweeted out, First paddles were illegally having too much grit. Now they're illegally having too much deflection, which is the same thing as dwell time. Paddle testing needs not to be implemented with not just grit, but deflection as well. Not necessarily <laughs> the same thing. From what I understand, deflection is basically just how quickly the ball comes off the paddle. Dwell time is how long the ball stays on the face of the paddle. Okay. And they're but highly you would correlated. Test, yeah. Because they're a product of the same thing, essentially. Like you would, in order to test either of those things, you would be testing with this compression test that USA, it's, we're going to put out a blog. You should look at a picture. Jamie, put in the picture. (laughs) Um, It's like an industrial sized drill to test deflection of a a paddle. And it's Mm -hmm. all based on like applying weight and seeing what like the um, compression level is. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know how we're going to be able to test all these different things. Yeah. Right. Well, it's one, especially on site. Right. On site. And actually now there's there's timing issues, too. So what is stopping a company from making a paddle that passes? Right. It can legitimately pass. Yeah. But. If we're smart, why don't we make a paddle that deteriorates effectively? Yep. Right? So a lot of them do. Yeah. It deteriorates in a way that actually makes its playability better. Yeah. And so it passes. And then, you know, even if USA Pickleball does the same process they did at Nationals, where you have to have a sticker at the beginning of the tournament to say, hey, this paddle has been tested. Well, (coughs) now. I could go home and I could beat my paddle with a hammer if that's what it takes or put in the microwave or whatever, whatever, whatever it does to make this paddle better. And don't put your paddles in the microwave, please. (laughs) If you do, we we don't encourage it. If you do tag us on Instagram, (laughs) tag us on Instagram for sure. Definitely want to see it, but uh, (laughs) uh, we are not encouraging it. Yeah. So now it's almost like you need to be able to do all of these tests immediately after a match is completed Mm -hmm. or at least randomly. Like I think that random testing is enough of a deterrent. Yeah. Right. Should be enough of a deterrent. Yeah. But we're testing a lot of things now. We're testing, Mm -hmm. I don't think we're testing hardly anything effectively enough yet. Mm -hmm. Even our, I still think that the friction, the the whatever RZ, the the surface roughness is still an issue. I still don't think that you can say that you're going to test it, but I still don't think that the test is effective. Well, one of the things that, uh, so, and I don't know if they're, so at Pro Pickleball on Instagram, I think mm-hmm. they're. I think whoever runs that is pretty affiliated with USA Pickleball. I think it's Carl. Carl Schmitz runs Pro Pickleball, and I think now Carl is. Is I don't know what, exactly what his title is, but he's very involved in the um, yeah. paddle compliance stuff. Well, he's using we. He's saying we as if he's associated with with USA Pickleball, but he he is he is. To your point, <clears throat> there still isn't effective testing for surface roughness. And there isn't effective testing for uh, dwell time, particularly not on site, right? Because you need this like big, like massive device. The surface roughness is the stare at test right now. Um, but he commented on a, a clip of you and I talking about dwell time the other week. He said, we'll be upgrading to an optical scanning platform for surface features as reported last year, replacing the stare at. Also implementing a portable tensile tester for deflection testing at pro events. 
All paddles are tested for deflection, roughness, COF. I don't know what that is. Coefficient of friction? Oh, pretty good. If, if that's Maybe it, that was good, good for you. I, I like <laughs> yeah. to think that that's a good, good guess. Um, during certification. But still, like, during certification would be, like, when you get that USAPA stamp. And as we just said, dwell time increases as the paddle is used, right? So that still it, it could. wouldn't address that. Um, the compliance continues. The compliance program has been made more robust to address the flood of new paddles. Uh, so it sounds like they're taking steps to, like, improve both of those. But in doing so, aren't they just admitting that the tests right now are, like, completely fallible? I don't know. Let's get them on here. That could yeah. be a, that could be an interesting uh, interesting conversation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I sent them an email, so hopefully they uh, they get back. Yeah, that'd be that'd be good because uh, I think we could have an interesting conversation with them. Yeah. Um, and so with dwell time, so okay, yeah. So it increases with paddle usage. At least that's what a lot of people are saying, right? Like as the paddle gets worn in, um, the paddle face isn't as rigid and uh, dwell time, and then I guess deflection um, in increases. It's, it, it really kind of depends on the on the paddle and on the materials. Um, I don't think that that's something that we can say across the board is true. Some paddles go dead the longer you hit with them. Yeah, some paddles, that's for sure. Some paddles. Nobody talks about that, by the way. So many paddles go dead. Most of them. Yeah. Almost, almost all of them at this yeah. point. Yeah. And – a lot of people like can't tell when their paddle goes. So like my dad, I'm not going to put this brand on blast, but he swears by this brand. And uh, so I'm always like, give me your paddle. I'm going to play with it and tell you if it's dead or not. Because he needs to change his paddles way more uh, than than he is. And if you don't know how to feel for that, like you could be playing with a dead paddle. It could be like seriously affecting your game. For sure. What's your What's your test for a dead paddle? I just swing and hit with it. I mean, like you can just <laughs> you can just tell. You like, can just at, tell. Personally, there you I go, can guys. Tell. If you have a dead paddle, you yeah. can just tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there we go. Science. We're, yeah. Uh, Pickle Pod, all about science here. So my, all about data. My tests are shake it. If there's a rattle, that means something's come loose in the honeycomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. one piece of your honeycomb is broken. It means that the rest of your honeycomb is probably breaking down. Mm -hmm. And also, if your edge guard is coming loose, you can just super glue it. And you need to super glue it because if your edge guard is coming loose, it really throws off your your entire paddle. Um, it if you hit anywhere close to that edge guard when your when your edge guard is loose, it's going to give you a, a dead response. But you really can legitimately fix it just by putting a little bit of super glue back on there. Hmm. You there you go. Here first, I just saved you probably a <laughs> hundred bucks at least, depending on what paddle. I guess Selkirks aren't having that problem with that without the edge guard though. Some of them have yeah, the edge guard, right. but yeah. well, and we're yeah we're just seeing like more and more paddles without them. Um, yeah. But another thing with so maybe this is more deflection related. Well, it would be dwell time too, uh, but it changes the sound that the the ball makes when it makes contact with the paddle, which apparently, according to Rob Nunnery. Players rely on sound and quick exchanges, and that changes basically how you interpret where the ball is going to go. For sure, actually, that's a that's a really important um, observation, and it is it is true because <laughs> you can't really see in real time where the ball is hitting on the paddle, but you can hear whether or not it sounds clean. Yeah, right, right, mm -hmm. and so some of these paddles that are deteriorating effectively they sound really hollow they sound louder they sound kind of like a gearbox right you know how a, a, a couple years ago gearbox had a really distinct sound compared to any other paddle because a lot of their paddles it just seemed like it was just like a plank like a plank of wood basically like a it, it, like it didn't have a, a ton of like interior Sure. Again, more science. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm just saying the sound is different from any other paddle. Like these these juiced up paddles sound a little bit more hollow. They sound a little louder. And and when you hit it off center, it doesn't give you that same shanky sound. 
So I think Rob's, I don't think Rob's wrong there. And that, that sound kind of, uh, it kind of hides potential mishits yeah. as well. So I don't think there's anything you can do about it. It's just like another interesting like nuance of this whole thing. Um, and then the last thing is like, it changes the way the ball, the ball leaves the paddle, like the angle. Really? Mm-hmm. Just having a, so it, mm, I don't know if I'd agree with that. Like, well, what, well back that it, back is it up. deflection, right? Isn't that what you were explaining as deflection is how deflection? quickly it comes off of the paddle. Okay. Right. So it wouldn't change the angle necessarily at which it comes off the paddle. Well, no, if the, if the paddle has more give, right? Like if I'm just, if I'm swinging at a slight angle, if it's more rigid, it's more likely to go directly in that like directly with my swing path, if there's more give, it will come off at more of an angle. Because the paddle face basically envelops the ball. Sure. I, I don't I don't think that that's noticeable. I don't think that the change in angle is noticeable. At least it's not anything that I've ever noticed. I'm hearing differently. Cite your sources, homie. Uh, well, so it's because it's not my source, but Kim on our team was talking to I think Lee Whitwell, who was saying like there was a paddle, she was playing against somebody uh, with one of these paddles, not a pro and not in tournament, but just like in rec. And it was like, it was insane the way the ball was coming off the paddle because of the like insane amount of deflection or possibly dwell time in this case. I think it, it definitely changes the way that the ball comes off the paddle, but I haven't noticed any difference in direction. So, uh, but it also could be a different paddle that I've never, never seen. So it's not something that I've seen, but I, it's plausible. Why do you think dwell time and deflection is all of a sudden like a thing? Because I think it's the, the most recent way of getting in advantage through your equipment. Yeah. Um, last year it was all about RZ and spin, right? And it still is important. And is RZ the metric that you test for yeah i don't know what the hell surface is. roughness i think so yeah 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 it's whatever metric they're like using for this whole thing right if that that's like the 40 when you take the six points of the paddle and then you average them out it needs to be below 40 correct i believe in so. rz we're gonna have a lot of fact checks on this episode <laughs> <laughs> but dude this is the thing is like okay so everybody else who's listening to this knows much less than we do i mean of course there are exceptions but like if we're on the front lines of this, I'm talking to these people. I'm talking to these manufacturers. I'm talking to people at USA Pickleball and I still don't know. You're playing on the tours and you still don't know. Isn't that like uh, an issue? I mean, imagine if you're just a rec player. Like I don't even know what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, but I also don't think it necessarily affects an average person nearly as much, right? I'm trying to, I, if I can get 1% more out of my paddle, like that's huge. Where if you're if you're an amateur player, just go 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 work on your hands. Like that's more important. <laughs> I mean, I should probably work on my hands too. Yeah. But uh, it does I don't think it's it doesn't have the same impact at that level. And you don't need to care about it as much. Like my dad uses one of those uh original carbon paddles. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that was probably very illegal. He's like, Yeah, I like it. I'm like, yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I can't really tell why, but it feels great. I'm like, I, I bet it does. Meanwhile, he's out here like just dicing up some four O's in, in Racine, Wisconsin. So, but he's not playing any tournaments. He's not, uh, he's not making any money off of it. So it doesn't really matter to him. Yeah. Right. But there's a lot of this stuff where you can get these advantages here, advantages there, and it could just make you a, a better rec player and there's really just like no way to enforce that in a casual tournament or like league play or whatever no probably not but i mean you get to the point it's like i suppose it's like golf where if you're just going out and playing with your buddies you could go use illegal clubs yeah like your buddies might not might not like it but like yeah. what are they gonna do right so it's the same idea yeah it's like if you're not playing actually competitively <clears throat> it's like who who really cares at yeah. that point yeah yeah but I think there's certain paddle brands that stand out in these conversations. I think one of the most recent is this like legacy paddle mm -hmm. that people are talking about. 
Um, and I was playing with Grant Bond in Mesa and he was using the legacy paddle when he had a forehand. It absolutely rocketed off the ball. But he did it, if he didn't come over it right, it was like long gone, right? Like it would leave the fencing. Uh, but when he did hit it right, it was like, I'm just going <laughs> to stick out my paddle and hope for the best. Yeah, I've been playing against some of those yeah. recently. And it's Grant was actually here in Austin a couple weeks ago. And, you know, love Grant. He's not exactly like the hardest hitter, right? <laughs> yeah. he's, not the, he's not the hardest. Hitter, neither am I. There's nothing wrong well, with that. He was when he was using this paddle. That guy was <laughs> was bagging me from the baseline yeah like he would just take a third shot he actually it was kind of funny he murdered a ball with the legacy paddle and like i didn't even think about getting out of the way of it and right. it just got like caught right in my in my between <laughs> yeah. my arm and my i didn't move an inch because i i couldn't like yeah that thing is that thing is just a rocket ship 